Hello, I am Padma Jasarathi. It gives me great pleasure indeed to be interviewing Dr. Parmeshwaran for the foundation for, on behalf of the Foundation for India Studies, Houston, for the Indo-American Oral History Project in partnership with the Houston Public Library and the Houston Community College System. Thank you. It's indeed an honor and a pleasure and a privilege for me to be talking to you and learning about your background, your uh, contribution to the Houston community. Let's begin with your uh, kind of early childhood years and your life in India before you came to Houston. Thank you, Padmida. I'm happy to be here. <clears throat> Looking back, I was born in Burma. Burma? Yes. Mm -hmm. My father That's was employed there at the time. And during the Second World War, they, had to, they were forced to get out of the country. And they came to Calcutta and from there on to Bombay, where my father found employment. Subsequently, my father got a new job in Chennai, and so we all moved to Chennai in 1947, and that's where my high school studies were done. So you have traveled around quite a bit. Yeah, but yeah, yes, yes. And uh, my medical education was in Chennai, and mm -hmm. I went to Stanley Medical College. And from then on, I always wanted to be a surgeon. So I decided to do my postgraduate studies in, and get an MS degree. And um, so, I, but I had to go to Bombay or Mumbai because there was some uh, discrimination going on in Tamil Nadu at the time against particular so races. So, what kind of discrimination? Uh, there was a discrimination against the upper class, upper caste, oh. and uh, so, and I was couldn't get the admission though. Uh, because you were a Brahmin. Yes. That was the reason. And, but in Bombay, there was no such discrimination going on. And uh, so at that time, at least. And so I could do my MS there. And then I returned to Chennai. And then I found an opportunity to further specialize in cardiothoracic surgery, which I did at Madras Medical College in Communal Hospital. And uh, just before coming to America, I was working as an assistant professor of cardiothoracic surgery at Communal Hospital. So what brought you to the United States? Because you had already done this subspeciality in surgery. It was just a pure uh, chance, I would say, because um, I wanted to further specialize in cardiothoracic surgery because it was still in infancy in India. And uh, that was my intention, and was planning to go to Australia for my further training. But one fine morning, I was just coming out of my operating room when I found a telegram from Wayne State University where the professor was offering me a research job at in Detroit General Hospital. And uh, I had to decide between going to Australia and coming to U.S. And talking to my friends and professors, they encouraged me to come to U.S. because they thought that the racial discrimination is much more in Australia mm -hmm. than in the U.S. So that's how I landed up here. And um, I joined as a research fellow at Wayne State University doing research on uh, liver transplantation for patients with hepatic failure. So and that was kind of different from what you were doing in India? It was sort of a different, but at the same time sort of connected because you know it involved the more or less the same technique and same procedures that I learned as a cardiothoracic surgeon. And, uh, and, uh, and we were the, almost the first to do a, a liver transplant from a baboon to oh. a human so being. So you, you pioneered there, huh? Uh, right. But unfortunately, of course, it, the, being a first procedure, we were not allowed to do it in a healthy or a well -to -do, fairly well-to-do patient, but this patient was in terminal illness, terminal, and uh, so we were, we were almost sure that may, most probably he may not survive because, like I said, selecting a terminal patient to do a radical procedure, you don't expect very wonderful results. But I know that was a very wonderful exper experience that I had while in Detroit. So you landed in Wayne State, and you were doing this fellowship there. And then, how did you find the kind of the transition from India to the U.S. and settling here and the society? It was, it was fairly smooth because um, the professor was very nice. They actually, the, the, my, my professor was at the airport to receive me when I landed in Detroit, and I was really surprised and uh, that, that is awesome. back. And uh, I had some friends from India, my undergraduate, my students in, from Madras were there 
doing their residency in Detroit. So then they made me feel at home, and they would give me rides in the car and uh, help me buy a rice cooker at the time, yes. Okay, so it kind of it made, they made your transition or settling here somewhat smoother. Did right. you face any kind of uh, racial prejudice or discrimination? No, not at that time, but uh, I did feel, find something, some, some mild discrimination, I would say, when I moved to Flint to do my residency, where I remember a patient uh, did not want me to examine him because he thought that we were taking away the jobs from Americans. And, uh, but I had to explain to him that this country did not have enough doctors and they, they wanted doctors from other countries and that they actually invited me and paid for my travel from India to the U.S. Mm -hmm. So what brought you to Houston? So you were Wayne State and then you were doing this um, residency. After I finished my residency, I was looking for a place to start my practice, and um, it was a small town called Sandusky, about 100 miles north of Detroit, and uh, the, there, was, there was a 50-bed hospital, and they did not have a surgeon. The surgeons were coming about 50 miles away, doing the surgery, and going back, and the family practitioners had to take care of the post-operative management. And so they came and invited me to join the hospital. Initially, I was reluctant because it's a very small town with about uh, 6,000 population. And, but anyway, we thought we'd go and have a look. And we found the community very inviting, a small, those a small town. And we, were, we, we, were, we realized that we were the first brown people to settle in that white community. But they were so friendly and so nice that we decided to move over there. So this is still in Michigan? You yeah, were still, still in Michigan. Michigan. Yeah, still and Michigan. You, had, uh, you were the surgeon in the local in the hospital? Local town. And um, I had the opportunity to do all kinds of surgery for which I was trained earlier, including uh, general surgery, gynecology, C-sections, orthopedic surgery, plastic surgery. So all the different kinds of surgery I could do there because I was the only surgeon. But when I moved to Houston subsequently, I realized that I, could, I had to restrict my surgical procedures to just general surgery, because there were OBGYN specialists, plastic surgeons, and orthopedic surgeons. So I was, I was not, I mean, no, no, sir, no general surgeon was able to do any of those specialized procedures because we will be cutting into their field. So in other words, you had gained some new skills over there, and you had to kind of let those skills rest yes. and focus only on general surgery. Yeah, that is true. But I was glad that I could do all those kinds of surgery, and, uh, and the community loved me. And I would like to add that when we moved there for the very first day, the newspaper reporter from the local newspaper office was there to do an interview and take our picture. And we made the front page news that week in the local community. So they celebrated the new surgeon who had moved here, the Indian <laughs> yeah, surgeon. Yeah, yeah. So you were in Michigan, and then you came here to Houston. Uh, did you have a family at that time? Were, were you married? And, uh, yes, yes. My wife had joined me about three months after I moved to came to be the, this country with the two boys, our children. So you had two sons. Uh, yeah, right. And in, in Sandusky, that's the name of the small town, where uh, there was only one school there at the time. And uh, the, there was not many uh, extracurricular activities at the school for the children. And um, also, uh, the winter was getting to us. It was almost uh, grew, growing up in Chennai and Tamil Nadu. We were not used to the cold weather and the snow, though we enjoyed it initially. Then we thought we, and uh, also the economy in Detroit was going down because the, uh, that was in 1980, in the 80s. And so we said we need to move somewhere else. And uh, Houston was obvious choice, being the, the weather being the same as in South India. So how old were your sons at that time? Uh, when we, they moved to the US, they were one year, one and three years old. Very young. Yeah, right. very young. Right. Young children. Yeah. OK. So when you moved to Houston, you started your own uh, practice. Right. Tell me, what was the, your experience like in Houston, both professionally and uh, in terms of your cultural experiences here? When we moved to Houston, of course, uh, I was not sure where I should start my practice or where should we should buy our house. And our friends told that the Fort Bend community has a very good school system. And so we decided to buy our, our house here in Fort Bend community. 
in Missouri City. And then um, I also started going to different hospitals initially. And, and then finally, I found that the Southeast Memorial Hospital in Houston was more conducive to me and more welcoming. I found them more welcoming to me, welcoming, and, and so I decided to start my practice over there. And, uh, and so this was uh, in the Southeast Memorial Hospital, and you decided to live in Fort Bend? Yes, because of the school system. So how did you find Houston then? Because I know Houston has changed a lot. Yes. And this has changed a lot, yes, this, especially since we were in the fairly, though Houston was very close by, still we thought it was a suburb, but we found that, that there was a lot of ranches very close to her house, with horses and cows uh, grazing in there. Uh, and it was just a the Highway 6, which is now an eight-lane road, was just a two-lane road initially, and then became four-lane. And now it is one of the busiest uh, highways in Houston. How did you find the hospital atmosphere and uh, compared to Michigan and compared to India and all that? Uh, of course, the hospital was uh, very much different from the one that we were practicing in, um, in India. The technology was uh, was of a very high standard, and uh, some of the technologies we are not familiar with even in uh, in India. In India, most of the diagnoses were based on clinical practice, whereas here the dependence was mostly on technology, and that I was found uh, a little very different because I found most of the doctors would go to the radiology department to look at the X-rays first before they even examine the patient. And we were really the other way around. We would examine the patient first, come to some, some conclusion, and then order the test that we need, we need it, and then treat the patient. But here, when a patient comes, it's a lot of tests which were unnecessary and not required were ordered, and then the patient would go into surgery or further treatment. So the whole approach was very different. Right. Okay. And then <coughs> when you came here, you did you feel any? Uh, find any discrimination either in the job or outside in the society? There was no obvious discrimination, but I did find that uh, in the hospital uh, some doctors were very welcoming and others were sort of a, kept a distance and uh, I realized that uh, they were not very happy to see me there. So, but, but amongst the patients, the patients loved me and uh, whenever they came to me and I, I was a surgeon, when they, were, they referred to me for surgery, and I would find that they needed some medical attention or some, or some other medical problem, then I would want to refer them to another medical doctor. And sometimes I would want them to want to refer them back to the same doctor who had referred them to me, but they would say, no, please refer to me an Indian doctor, because they felt that the Indian doctors were much more compassionate, they spent more time with them, and they didn't treat them as a business entity, because they thought the Western train, the local, Caucasian doctors were more business-like than us. So, in a way, that was your first contribution, that you changed the impression of people uh, about Indian doctors, and you raised the bar for them. Now, they all had to stand up to your standard of being compassionate and patient and very caring. And uh, so that began your journey of continuous contribution to this community. I know you have done a lot. Uh, in terms of not only your profession, but extending it professionally. Uh, I know that you also went into alternate medicine. Yeah, it's, uh, it's strange because as a surgeon, uh, I was very skeptical but about all the other uh, fields of medicine like uh, Ayurveda or acupuncture or Chinese traditional medicine. Uh, <clears throat> and. Uh, but I, just by sheer accident, I have, but I was in a small town in Sandusky in Michigan. One of the physicians claimed that he had done all the surgeries under hypnotherapy hypnosis because there was no anesthesiologist available at the time. I'm talking about the uh, late 60s and the early 70s. When the, and this, so I couldn't believe it because he said he had done C-sections under hypnosis, orthopedic uh, fractures and uh, appendectomies. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so when I told him that I didn't believe him, he said, <laughs> you know, he was in his 80s. He offered to, uh, he invited me to come and watch him do the hypnosis. And uh, there were a couple of nurses in the hospital who were suffering from migraine attacks. And uh, with just one session of hypnosis, these patients, these nurses who were taking two or three different medications for the migraine for several years, 
they found that there was no more need to take this uh, medications because they had no more uh, migraine attacks and they didn't have it for almost three years till I, as long as I was there. And so I was really impressed that mind over body really is, it matters a lot and can control a lot of your physical problems, medical problems. So how did that get you into uh, other areas? <coughs> yeah, so I got trained under hip, in, in hypnosis, uh, the American so Medical so Society of Medical Hypnosis, and started practicing hypnosis for patients who wanted to quit smoking, who wanted to lose weight, for pain management, for stress, and to overcome phobias, and et cetera. And I found that it really worked very well because, I, you know, because your mind really can do a lot of things. And even I could do some minor surgeries in my office purely under hypnosis for patients who did not have medical insurance or who could not afford to go to the hospital because of the expense uh, there. So you were doing this in parallel to the regular right. surgery as well as hip, you know, hypnosis yes. instead of anesthesia. Yes, and also um, patients were always apprehensive before surgery and so I could use my knowledge of hypno hypnosis to calm them down and take the fear out of their uh, and apprehension about surgery and so they could go through the surgery without much fear and uh, and we started having some uh, music CDs and also relaxing CDs which we could use in the preoperative waiting room area where the patient could listen to it and calm down for the surgery. So, but you also have done, I know a lot of work in the area of acupuncture. Yes, uh, that was also by a sheer accident. I happened to see a video but during my training as a resident where a patient in China was undergoing thoracic surgery where the lung was being removed solely under acupuncture. The patient is awake, talking to the surgeon and uh, drinking uh, sipping lemonade and his lung was being removed. There was no anesthetic machine by the side <laughs> no anesthesiologist, and I thought there was, so there was really something in uh, acupuncture. So I started reading about it, and I got an opportunity to get trained in UCLA, uh, where they kind of were conducting a course to train um, physicians in acupuncture. So I took that course about 15 years ago, and I've been doing that uh, since then, along with my surgical practice, and I found it extremely helpful, and uh, can avoid a lot of invasive procedures and patients can resort to the non-invasive technique that like hypnosis or acupuncture. So in other words, you have really expanded on your surgical training into going to a very multidisciplinary type yes. of approach to treatment. Yes, I did, but this is totally non-traditional, and other doctors felt that I must be crazy um, to be doing this, and uh, even uh, there were some not about myself, but there were articles that were saying that doctors who practice this kind of alternative medicine are quacks and their license should be taken away. But now, and not about 10, 15 years now, the leading medical centers in this country, including Harvard Medical School, Yale School, Princeton, all those medical schools are doing research in alternative medicine, and they have a separate department of alternative medicine where they teach acupuncture, yoga, hypnotherapy, traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, and things like that. So it's becoming more and more into mainstream medicine now. So many, many years ago, you had the foresight to kind of integrate medicine. And so that's one of your other major contributions. I know you have also been involved uh, in this community in other ways, too, in terms of, uh, I know of your drives for... Uh, yes. Uh, in 1996, I happened to see an advertisement in India abroad about a young 21-year-old girl by, Rishali, by name Rishali. She had just graduated and was diagnosed to have leukemia and was not responding to chemotherapy. She needed a bone marrow transplant and could not find a match because finding a match for bone marrow transplantation is very difficult because the, the best match is in the same eth ethnic community. That means only a South Asian can match with a patient with leukemia for a bone marrow transplantation. And there's a national bone marrow registry in this country where out of seven, seven million registrants, 
about 70 percent of them are Caucasians, and the minority group form about 25 percent, and the South Asian com community just less than one percent of the 25 percent. So, and to find a match is, is one in 10,000 to one in 100,000 only will match with the patient. And so, unless a large number of Indians and South Asians are registered in this registry, patients with leukemia cannot find a bone marrow transplant to save their lives. So when I read that story in the, in the advertisement in the newspaper, I thought that it really uh, hurt, you know, touched my heart, and I decided that I got to do something about it. And at that time, after, on an inquiry, I found that nobody was doing any kind of drive to recruit uh, South Asians into the registry. So and then so I found out how to do it, and since then I've been doing for the last 16 years conducting bone marrow registration drives. So you the st you started it in Houston. Yes, I did. Yeah. Completely on your own. Yes, on my own, and so any time I got an opportunity or hear about gatherings of Indians at uh, different temples or different social functions, I would arrange to conduct a drive, and um, it was very rewarding in the sense that I could register group probably in the last 16 years probably close to 1,000 people. But at the same time, a little disappointing that uh, many patients, many people would not come forward to register, or you, some of them, even after registering to be donors, would not come forward to donate the marrow or stem cell, which would mean that almost like a death sentence for that patient. What holds them back from, you know, donating? Pardon? What holds them back from? Yeah, mostly it's superstition, fear that uh, something could happen to them if they donate their marrow, though. We have a lot of marrow in our body, and only about a very small amount of marrow will be taken, and this marrow will recover, re regenerate within a couple of weeks. In spite of telling all this, still the fear, lack of information, ignorance about the thing, it kept them away. But there were, I remember one instance where a, a, a young lady had refused to register to be a donor, but at the subsequent drive, she came back saying that her cousin has been diagnosed with leukemia, and now she wanted to donate the marrow. So similar. So sometimes I would tell the people who come for the thing where the, the wife might want to register, but the husband will not, or vice versa. And I would tell them that one of their own family members needed it. That unless you, they register to be a donor, bone marrow is not something that you could buy in the grocery store, and they just got to come from their own kit and kin. But only 25% will match within the family, and the rest of them have to go outside to find a match. This was quite a significant uh, contribution to this Houston community you have made. Also, you were involved with some cultural and temple activities as well. Yeah, I was elected. Uh, I don't know how you found <laughs> the time. I was elected to the Meenakshi Temple Board as its secretary a few several years ago, and uh, I was also a, a president of the Indian Doctors Club. Oh. Then more recently, I joined the Indo-American Cancer Network. Where they again they wanted me to be a part of that. So. The India Cancer Network. That's for creating greater awareness, or uh, great, great awareness, and also to help patients diagnosed with cancer, you know, so that uh, they can navigate through the uh, process of uh, finding a doctor, you know, and what to do after the diagnosis. Because once you're diagnosed with cancer, they, it is always felt that it's a like a death sentence, though it is not anymore. And so tell them the importance of early diagnosis, and in case they need some help to go to the hospital for treatment, or help at home to take care of their children, or cooking, things like that. So this network was started a few years ago by one of the community members, and I was happy to be associated with them. Mm -hmm. Extraordinary contribution. So are you sons following in your footsteps and uh, I was emulating you in... Uh, I was hoping initially they would because I thought this was a very noble profession where I could help a lot of people. But, um, and then while well, they were in school, one, one of them wanted to be a neurosurgeon and the other one wanted to be a cardiovascular surgeon. And he even interviewed uh, Dr. Denton Cooley's secretary yeah. to find out uh, about Dr. Cooley. And they, were, they wrote papers on medical topics. But they went, but they, when they graduated to go to college and exposed to so many different subjects, their art subject, their vision, their, uh, their, uh, their interest changed, and one became passionate about philosophy and economics, and the other one um, thought he was going to be a lawyer, though he had to decide between going to law school 
and to film school in because oh. he got a scholarship at the New York Film School and the other one also into a, one of the top colleges for law, law school. And uh, but that's why I told him to follow his passion. And um, so he finally he decided to go to the law school. And then subsequently, after finishing from law school, his passion was to write. Mm -hmm. And he's now a writer and got a book of fiction published a year, two years ago. He's a celebrated writer now. Well, luckily, he got good reviews uh, for his uh, book. And he's working on his second book now. Yes. And he got several grants and fellowships to do that. Did you or your children face any kind of uh, challenge, or discrimination, or any unpleasant experiences in the uh, Houston area? Or? As far as you know, there was not really discrimination. But uh, earlier in Michigan, when they went to the small school, uh, they, like I said, they were, they were the only brown-skinned people there. So the children had not seen anybody as before. So they were they thought they were African Americans, and uh, so they did pass some unfortunate remarks. And uh, but in the schools over here, they did not feel any obvious discrimination. And they deny that. But I know that when they went to school, they, the, the lunch they wanted to carry was not uh, the Indian, any kind of Indian food. They just wanted a peanut butter sandwich throughout the school year because they did not want to carry. Uh, Indian rice or chapatis that could smell and they would be different uh, compared to other students. So what kind of, um, so generally everything was very positive. Yes, it did. Uh, so you didn't have too many, uh, it, you didn't ha hardly have any unpleasant uh, uh, episodes or not? Uh, no, luckily, as I said, you know, we were really, uh, really uh, lucky that the uh, Students, uh, I mean, our children could go to good schools without uh, going through any discrimination that could have happened in India. And uh, I too could uh, carry on my profession and get introduced to so many different fields and different uh, social and cultural activities, different fields that I could volunteer and my wife could volunteer. So in those ways, we really had a very enriching experience. So in other words, you know, <coughs> they say, uh, of course, America is a land of immigrants and. Uh, Everyone is enriched by the country you live in, but you have also considerably enriched the community you have lived in. So what kind of a message or something for you to share with the stream of immigrants who, from India who are coming and settling in the Houston area? Yeah, initially, when you come to this country, it may be a little uh, difficult to get used to the life over here, and um, but if you stay focused for the reason that you came to this country, either for further education or for your profession, stay focused and follow your passion. Even though the field you may want to specialize may not fall into the category of the traditional fields like what I did. I, though I was a surgeon, I had an open mind. I got introduced to alternative medicine, and. Uh, volunteerism and the hope you will keep your mind open but follow your passion and not worry about what your your friends or your parents would want you to do because if your parents might want you to follow their own field of field of uh, profession but feel free to discuss with them and tell them that your passion is somewhere else and don't be afraid to follow your passion and um, if you do if you continue to work hard in the field of that you of, of your choice, I think you will shine and do much better than choosing a profession that somebody else wants you to follow. Do you miss uh, India a lot or you feel quite comfortable here or how do you compare the two uh, types of cultures and way of living and... Uh... Yeah, I mean after so many years we are very comfortable living here but at the same time we do love going back to India because that's after all our homeland, and every time we go, we do love, love the experience over there. And those things are different, but we do, we are happy that we, we did come here because of the opportunities that I had here, and also the opportunities that our boys are able to, are able to experience. And besides all these professional uh, 
work and uh, all these volunteer work. I know that you also enjoy some specific hobbies. Yes. Did you did you bring anything? I know that you love to paint. Yeah. Did you bring any for no, us to no. share? No, <laughs> I didn't bring any. But I did, uh, even as a child, I liked to, uh, I was interested in drawing. And when, I, when the lecture was boring, I'd be drawing some human figures or some scenery on my, my notebook. And uh, subsequently, I got interested in um, painting and uh, took some lessons by, from a private teacher. When, initially, when I came to Houston, and I, and I did uh, paint, uh, done a few paintings, which I'm very proud of. And uh, I would like to continue to do that. It takes quite some time and it does need you know, patience, and, uh, but I would enjoy doing that, yes. So you still do that? You still yes, paint? Yes, I still paint. How long does it take for you to take, uh, let's say, does it vary from uh, Yeah, definitely, yeah, painting, right, yeah. Or? It depends upon the, the one that I want to paint, and some of them might take weeks because I may not be able to sit on a, on a daily basis to do the painting because it may take two, two to three hours to complete something that I'm doing it. But I may have to stop in the middle, and by the time I'm ready to do the next, continue that, it may be another three, two, three, four days, or even sometimes weeks to finish the painting. So do you do landscape or portrait? Or? I really, I, I like doing landscapes. I have attempted doing portraits of my family and my mother recently, who passed away last, last year. Now, going back to you know your professional work, what would you say was your most favorite? What's your most favorite kind of outside of the surgery, which is your profession? I know you went into the drive the, for the bone marrow and acupuncture uh, and um, all this, you know, doctors of the uh, India Doctors Foundation. Which one was your most favorite activity that you still uh, feel very passionate about? I was very passionate about recruiting uh, South Asians for the bone marrow registry okay. because in the last few years I've seen young children, young adults dying because they could not find a match. Just because not enough Indians are registered in the National Bone Marrow Registry and it's a simple procedure where they could uh, donate a little marrow or stem cells from their peripheral blood and then I felt very sad that our Friends in the community were not willing to do that uh, minimal, um, small thing that could do to save lives. They were not coming forward to do that. So I feel sad about it, but hopefully things will change with further education. On their part. Now, finally, let me ask you: um, uh, What kind of advice would you have for? Uh, the immigrants who are coming in, who are coming in, let's say, maybe they are surgeons, professionals, uh, because now the number of Indian immigrants, South Asian immigrants, have increased considerably yes. in the Houston area yes. compared to when you came here, yes. what, 30 years ago? Yes. Was it about more, 30 more years? More than that. Really. More than that. So life has changed a lot. A lot of support system has been established for the immigrants. So, would you prefer it then when there were limited number of South Asian immigrants to now when they are large, or do you prefer it this way? And what kind of guidance and ideas and strategies would you suggest to this continuing stream of immigrants who are settling in? Yeah, when we came first in '73, it was almost 40 years ago. Uh, we were the Indian community was very small. And so we, so we did, it was easy for us to get into the mainstream organizations and communities. We could volunteer and uh, uh, come to know them better. But now I find that with the larger Indian community, the people seem to be confining themselves to the local ethnic groups. And uh, several associations have been started with each language, um, each, each language groups wanting their own association and people being very, following a very narrow path in their own community. But I would encourage them to join the mainstream, you know, get involved in mainstream activities and associations, and volunteer for many social activities in the community. 
So in conclusion, let me ask you, what would be your parting words of wisdom to the younger generation? Two things, I'm going to, it's going to be two, two questions. First, for the younger generation, uh, what would be for the young people who are the first generation citizens, you know, like your sons who grew up here, what would be your kind of words of uh, advice or guidance? I'll tell them to aim high, have a goal, focus on your goal, because there are a lot of distractions in this country which probably when we were growing up we did not have uh, so many distractions like uh, drugs, alcohol, girlfriends and boyfriends at very young age, and so you very easy to get distracted. But stay focused and continue and, and, and find out what your passion is. And as long as you follow your passion and work hard, you can achieve your dream and you'll be successful in this country. Thank you. And then, do you have anything against something similar to that for the wave of immigrants coming in uh, on a regular basis from India? I would, I would um, just give them the same advice, you know, to join the mainstream, not be confined to their own group. And though, though that is important to not to forget their uh, heritage and things like that, but at the same time, if you're going to live in this country, you need to get involved in the mainstream activities and be part of them. Thank you very much. Thank it you. It was a pleasure. Thank you, President. It was a pleasure.